Hey everyone, welcome back to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. Chicago Med is an emotional thrill ride through the day to day chaos of the city's trauma center and into the lives of the courageous doctors, nurses, and staff who hold it all together. Today I'm sitting down with Tori DeVito, AKA Dr. Natalie Manning, who finds herself in a dangerous situation during tonight's episode. Take a look. Put your hands together for Tori DeVito. Hello. Tori, I don't think that she's fine. She keeps saying I'm fine. I don't think she's fine. I don't think she's fine either. I mean, I think her, literally, her arm is out of the socket. Exactly. So I don't think she's fine. I know how these shows work, and I'm a little nervous. And I was <laughs> looking through social media on Twitter. A lot of the fans of the show are a little concerned. Yeah. So can you walk us through this episode? Are we? I mean, what's going to happen? Well, it's funny because I've gotten a lot of comments on Instagram, people being like, I'm so worried to watch tonight. Are you written off the show? And I was like, my God, when I read this episode, I didn't think that. <laughs> no. Um, so, you know, you see, sh she lives. But um, the cool thing is, is that, you know, Will is the one that comes to save her. And they've been going through so much. And it's one of those things like, will this bring them closer, this almost death experience? Or will it kind of tear them apart more? Like, what will ever bring them closer or apart? Because they're in such turmoil right now. I think people were concerned because in the commercial, <laughs> the narrator is like an unforgettable Chicago. And they you're like, always what? do that, right? Why is it unforgettable? Like, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, why? <laughs> it stressed me out. So I'm glad to know that she makes it through. Uh, what what was it like shooting in that situation? Because it looks like you're in a little helicopter. Was it yeah. just, what was that set like? It was freezing. It looks it cold. It was really, really cold. Um, but it was a lot of fun because, you know, I'm in the hospital most of the time. So it was really cool getting outside. And I kept using my imagination. And I was like, if I pretend this quarry looks like I could be, like, in the mountains somewhere. I don't know where. But, like, I kept being like, like, there was little... Um, I was calling them rivers, but they weren't rivers. It was just melted snow. But I was like, look, it looks like a little lake over here. Like, we could be in, like, I don't know, Big Bear or something. And my castmates were like, no. They're like, no, it's a helicopter no. crash, and it's really you cold. You can keep your dreams over there, and we'll be over here living real life, working. <laughs> I was like, okay. Were there any bloopers or odd moments working in that tight little space? Yes, a lot. Um, the little kid who was on the stretcher, who was such a trooper, I mean, to ask a five-year-old to be still on a stretcher in the cold, it's like criminal almost. It's like to tell a five-year-old just to sit still is like hard enough. And every time we do something, because kids don't get that you're like, okay, I'm going to pretend now. And if you go, ow, they'll still go, oh, no, because they don't get that whole concept. So every time the kid would have to keep his eyes closed, we'd be like, okay, keep your eyes closed, ready, action. And I'd be like, ah, he'd go like this. He'd be like. <laughs> and I was like, no, no. <laughs> and then we'd have to start all over again. And they'd be like, all right, Miles, you got to keep your eyes closed, man. Come on, you can do this. And it was just, it was really cute. That's so cute. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, the characters on Chicago Med go through so many different trials and tribulations. When you sat down and saw this script and saw where this story was going, does it even shock you anymore? You're like, ah, this is par for the course. Yeah, kind of, especially this year. I feel like our episodes have gotten bigger yeah. and there's been more, you know, traumas and, and the characters themselves have gone through bigger yeah. crisis. And um, so I'm not so surprised anymore. But when I read the helicopter crash, I was surprised. I was like, whoa, we've never done anything <laughs> like that. How are we going to film that? Am I going to be up in the air? And they were like, no. I was like, <laughs> Okay, good. <laughs> Thank God. Do you have any fear of flying? Because if you didn't, that would make you have one. I, I don't like. have fear of flying, but good. I do have a severe fear of heights. Really? Oh, my God. Yes. Um, and I've never been in a helicopter, mm. unless I was a kid and I just don't remember. But as an adult, I don't remember ever being in a helicopter, so I was a little nervous that maybe that would trip the fear of heights because planes don't. Yeah. I feel fine in a plane. Helicopters are a little different, They're though, because you can look straight down mm -hmm. and... Yeah, it's pretty, yeah, you should maybe avoid those yeah, if you don't like sure, heights. Sure, sure. Um, so the show's in its fourth season now? Yeah, fourth season. And your character, speaking of storylines, has had a lot happening to her. She's had, she's been widowed, she's a working mom, she's had failed marriages. Like, yeah. where, where do you like, where would you like her to go? Or what are you hoping for her? Uh, gosh, I, I want so much for her. It's it. I'm so torn because... For the sake of the show, I want all this dramatic stuff to keep happening for her because I know it's fun to watch, and for me, it's fun to play. But if she was a real person, I'd be like, girl, you need to go to therapy. You need to go to a relationship therapist, <laughs> a regular therapist. <laughs> you need to figure some stuff out because it's just so chaotic. She can't catch a break. Do you feel 
like, do you start to feel like you know this character? Do you take things personally? Like, what is that relationship like? Because playing a character season after season must become like a very intimate experience. Yeah. So for me, like, when I have to do emotional scenes, for me personally as an actor, I always have to bring a little bit of my personal life mentally into it just to kind of get me there. And I know a lot of actors don't do that, but that's just my process. And so I always leave emotional scenes almost feeling a little embarrassed sometimes, like, oh my God, did I just expose myself? Because I forget that people can't actually, don't actually know what's going on in my head. And then sometimes things start blending with Natalie and I start not really knowing like, who's feeling that right now? Is that me or is that Natalie? And then like, I can kind of tether my what's going on in my personal life sometimes with hers. And I'm like, oh man, this is getting <laughs> way too um, real. But I've also on the flip side learned so much from her so it's just it's really cool and that and now like you know season one is like when I got a scene the night before I would spend like six hours just saying it over and over again I was so my work ethic was like through the roof and now I just know her so well that it's like it just kind of I read one a scene and I'm like oh yeah I get it and then as an actor, you get confused too, like, wait, am I not putting enough work into my work anymore? Like, am I slipping? What does this mean? But it's interesting being on a show that goes for this long, because you just really do become one with the character you're playing. How do you memorize your lines so quickly? Is, is it just something you do from getting to know the character and being, because what you just said sounds terrifying to me. <laughs> There's so much dialogue in the show. Yeah, it's interesting because memorizing lines, you know, it's, it's a muscle. Yeah. Um, so the more you use it, the easier it becomes. And so I feel like because I use it all the time, I can look at something sometimes and just know it after the first read. The medical stuff is a little trickier because a lot of times it's a pronunciation thing. I read it and I'll go to the table read and I'll say it and everything I said at the table read, they come up to me and they're like, here's the real pronunciations. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> like I tried. <laughs> yeah, I did my best. <laughs> um, so that gets a little harder. But even that now, like I'll read a pronunciation and it's easier. Before season one, I couldn't sleep. Every day was like the first day of school. And if I had medical jargon, I'd walk around the streets of Chicago and I I would just say it all day. That one where people probably thought I was crazy because I was just like <laughs> repeating that word. And it's not like New York and LA where everybody here is used to actors probably walking around mouthing things to themselves. Chicago, they would like walk into a Starbucks. I'm just standing in line saying like the same word over and over again. They're like, uh, okay. A little Rain Man situation. Yeah, totally. <laughs> what is it like living in Chicago, especially now in the winter? Yeah, the winter, you guys know. I mean, you all live in New York. Um, the winter is a little brutal. It's a little different than L.A., mm -hmm. but I am a New York native, so it's somewhere in my blood. Right. Um, uh, I love Chicago. It's become one of my favorite cities. Mm -hmm. It's really, really cool. I do love that that's, you know, the the thread between all the, the Chicago shows. Yeah. It's actually filmed there, and that is such a, it's like another character in the show. Totally. So I love, even though you have to deal with those winters, that I know you can go back to L.A. when you're not working, right? Yes. That's yes, amazing. but when we're not working is the summer, oh. which is the great time to be in Chicago. <laughs> so has this show um, increased your interest in the health field at all? Because I know you do some hospice work, and I was reading that, and I was like, oh, that makes sense. If, if you're around this all the time, it sort of maybe did it. Is that what sparked that interest, or were you involved before? No, I actually started doing hospice volunteering when I was like 23 or 24. So I'd been doing it for a really long time and I um, became the ambassador for National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization and I've been working with them since then as well. And so I always just loved that. I always felt like if I wasn't acting, I would totally go to school to become a funeral director. I just feel really at ease in that place. I've worked a bunch of funerals as a volunteer and um, and I was like, man, I, I could open my own funeral home. I could like, um, you know, make it a progressive funeral home. Like if you want to be buried as a tree or a mushroom, great. I've got those options. You know what I mean? Like I, I just really always love that so much. So volunteering for hospice kind of like scratched that itch for me. Yeah. And then I feel like because Natalie on the show specializes in pediatrics, I was able to thread that with hospice volunteering because, you know, I feel like at the end of life, you kind of like make that circle to kind of how you became, how you wow. began, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I feel like my hospice volunteering helped me get the job of Chicago Med. Yeah. Is there something that really sparked your interest in hospice care? Because saying you want to be a funeral director is kind of a unique, I did not expect you to say that, but it's such an important role in people's lives. Yeah, I, 
It was weird. I was on a show, and I was really depressed when I was, like, 23. I felt, like, really, really down. And I knew I loved acting, but I was getting used to... Hollywood. Like I knew I loved acting, but there were aspects of the business that I was like, oh man, am, am I strong enough for this? Like, can I stomach this? And I was feeling like really down and I wanted to maybe volunteer with kids. I was like, maybe I should just volunteer and get my mind off of all of this. So I put in the Google search, you know, volunteer with kids and hospice popped up. And I had no idea what that was. I'd never even heard that word before. And I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. And I clicked on it and I called. And they were like, oh, we have a training this weekend. It's three weeks, three weekends in a row. And I signed up, didn't even know what I was getting involved in. And I just like fell in love with it. So I feel like it was kind of fate because I wasn't looking for it. Um, and then, of course, like all my friends and even my mom, like when I told her, I was like, so I'm going to be a hospice volunteer. And they were like, honey, you're already a little down. Like, don't you think this may be a little detrimental? And I was like, quite the opposite. Like, it brings so much light. And then since then, my mom actually started volunteering herself for hospice. And, like, all my friends have, like, somehow, like, gone involved. And they're like, wow, we had no idea. So it's cool. I didn't know you could volunteer for hospice. Yeah, I know. I didn't either. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. And I think, you know, it probably gives you just a new perspective yeah. and sort of putting things into, like, this is actually not that big of a deal. People right. are going through real life right. situations. It's the one thing we all have in common, I mean, other than, you know, being human beings, right. which we all have in common too, but like, we're all gonna die. It's not, you know what I mean? It's just the way it is. And so to have, be there to help that person move to that next phase, whatever it may be, in the most comfortable, mm -hmm. respectful way possible, I just think it's really cool. That's so cool. And you mentioned that hard time, and you were, I mean, you spent most of your 20s on these shows, Vampire Diaries, Pretty Little Liars, One Tree Hill. What has your experience been like? Like When you look back at yourself, what has been the biggest thing you've learned and sort of grown in this industry? Because I would imagine in your 20s, you're just changing constantly. Yeah. Oh, gosh. My <laughs> 20s. So funny. I always joke like I'd never go backwards to 20s. I feel like I was like a mess. Like I cried like every day. I say that I all the time. I'm like, you could not pay me to be 22 again. No, I had so much anxiety. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know who I was. I was like, help me. <laughs> um, but it was interesting, like being on these shows that people still, I, now with Netflix, yeah. it's crazy. It's like a resurgence of One Tree Hill watchers, really? like young kids. And I'm like, well, you didn't, and they're like, Netflix. I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense. Um, it just, it was really cool and interesting to be going through your awkward 20s on such teen shows because people have this view like, oh, you're on this show, you must be like this character, you must like kind of have it together. And I was like, no. nope. Not even close. <laughs> but it was, it was a really cool experience. Like all three of those shows I learned so much from and I'm so grateful to be a part of. Yeah. When you go back and watch yourself as an actress at that time, do you ever cringe or are there things that you're like, oof? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. The first half of, I feel like all my episodes on One Tree Hill, I was like shaking on, because oh, really? that was like my first big yeah. job. And I was so nervous every day. Like my body, my physical body shakes when I get nervous, it's like the first thing that happens rather than like the last, like when I'm really nervous. It's like, even if I'm a little nervous, I can't hide it. And so I would go on set and when it'd be my coverage, I'd be like shaking. And I felt like at night, I'd be like, I don't even know if I did a good job. I feel like I blacked out. Like, did I say my lines right? Like, I was so worried I'd get fired every day. I was like, do they like me? <laughs> um, but then when I came back around and I got to be crazy Nanny Carey, I had so much fun. Like, yeah. I just let it all go. I was like, you're here. They brought you back. This wasn't even a part of the role that I auditioned for. Right. So I felt more comfortable after yeah. that. And look, we're all growing and taking on new roles. And you're obviously a very successful actress. But I know you're also getting into producing as well. Yes. I saw the film Saving Daisy, which I followed that story. So, oh, And I didn't cool. know you were part of the upcoming documentary they're making. Yeah. Yeah. So Saving Daisy is kind of the follow-up to Audrey and Daisy on Netflix. And it follows Daisy Coleman on her path to healing and recovering from PTSD and other lifelong traumas from sexual abuse and assault and, you know, losing family members. And, um, you know, her and this girl, Ella Farron, who was in the Audrey and Daisy documentary as well, they kind of came 
came together because they became really close uh, during the documentary when they went and they created an organization called Safe Bay. And that's how I met them because I started working with Safe Bay because I really wanted to work with teen girls about, you know, consent and sexual assault and all that stuff. And, um, and Daisy realized after she had just lost her brother this last summer that there are layers and layers and layers of trauma that she's never even dealt with. And all these young girls who are survivors themselves look up to her and she's like, how can I keep standing for them if I'm not healing? And so she took it upon herself, her and Ella, to like do this publicly, mm -hmm. to document the process so that when other survivors are watching it, they feel inspired that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, you know? And I just think that's so brave that she's doing that. And so when Ella approached me and she's like, I'm directing this thing, do you want to produce it? I was like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, this is I'm like a dream come true. I'd love to be a part of this project, so. Yeah, it's so important. And do you feel like things like Me Too and Time's Up have helped people be more aware? And maybe, because I, I know there was a Kickstarter to yeah. actually donate and getting involved. Yeah, that was really amazing. I was nervous doing a Kickstarter because one thing I hate doing is asking anyone for favors. Like asking like, can I have your money? It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Um, so putting that out there and like asking fans to donate and asking people in the Twitterverse and all that kind of stuff and friends and, you know, even family members. Like I was like nervous passing it on to them. I didn't want people to feel like I was imposing, but but um, to see the response, like, and, and also I had, you know, family members that came out to me and told me stories that they'd gone through that I didn't even know about. And, and we got so much closer and I had people opening up to me and, and sharing their tales with me. And I was like, whoa, this is, and I do think that is um, part of what the Me Too movement has really done. It's made people more vocal and honest about their own stories, you know, because people feel more of the support. And they're like, okay, it's I can do this because I want to support you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say this hoping that you'll feel comfortable coming out now if you want to. Yeah. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, you see it over and over again. The moment one person speaks up, other people speak up. Yeah. And even in art in Chicago Med, I'm sure there's a lot of storylines that you guys cover, situations that people are going through, and then they feel better. They feel like they can take action in their own life. Do you ever right. get feedback from fans about storylines you've done? Like, you know? Yeah, we do actually get feedback from fans saying, like, you know, I suffered from that, or I had a family member that suffered from that. We get a little backlash too. We've had some episodes where, you know, medically the show has maybe said something about something, and they're like, how could you do that? And I'm like, I didn't write it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but what I love about our writers, too, is I feel like Natalie gets a lot of um, really topical situations, too. Like, she got to deal with immigration this year, and now she's dealing with, you know, the whole gun situation. And, and I just feel so honored every time they give me a script where I can yeah. deal with that stuff. And it's so cool, especially on a network, that they're willing to bring attention to certain yeah. topics and knowing that some of the audience may not always appreciate yeah. it, but being fair and balanced and just trying to tell stories. Totally. I'm always proud of our writers in that way. They never write for the sake of keeping an audience. Yeah. They write because that's what they want to put out there. And if people don't like it, then they can change the channel. Yeah. There's plenty of other TV guys. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> You've got With Netflix yeah. and everything now, are you crazy? <laughs> There's millions. <laughs> I love that. Well, I know the audience has a couple questions, cool. so let's go to them. Who do we have first? Or do we just have Twitter? Oh, sorry. We oh, have a Twitter, Twitter. question. Um, so if you were a doctor in real life, what unit would you want to work with? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, I think I would do emergency medicine just because, yeah, it keeps you on your toes. That's what we trained in, too. They actually put us in um, uh, medical scrubs. Uh, not medical scrubs. Med student scrubs. Sorry. And we got to pretend to be med students in a real hospital in Chicago. And we were pushed like in front of all the real life traumas and everything. And it's just nonstop. Because I think if I was a doctor and I had time to like breathe and, and realize what I was dealing with, I would just like crumble. Yeah. <laughs> so that adrenaline was like whew, crazy. That is like the opposite department I would choose. That would stress me out. Yeah. I would be like a dentist. <laughs> dentist. <laughs> Our next question is also from Twitter. Comes from Kathleen is Wicko. Uh, where do you draw inspiration from for Natalie and in life? Oh, gosh. Um, really everywhere. Yeah. You can find random inspiration everywhere. Sometimes it's a family member. Sometimes it's 
a boyfriend, girlfriend, friends, sisters. My dogs give me a lot of inspiration. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes just walking down the street, seeing so, something street art, something someone's totally. written on the wall. Books, I read all the time. I love getting little quotes from books and poems and whatnot. What's the last book you read? I just finished this one called QB7. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's actually my boyfriend's mom's favorite, all-time favorite book. So I read it. It was really, it's called Queen's Bench 7, QB7. Okay. Yeah, it's really interesting. I need to check that out. I'm trying yeah. to read more. Th- that's like one of my news resolutions. Yeah, you should read Did it. Did you make a resolution? Um, you know what? I didn't make a specific resolution, but overall, like, I just wanted to be softer yeah. this year. Hmm. Like, whenever I get triggered about something, you know, I'm part Sicilian. My father's sitting in the back. He can attest to that. Hey, Dad. He passed that on to me. I can go from zero to 100 really quickly <laughs> when I get angry. And I was like, this year, like, even in traffic, because I always say, like, the day that I can be calm when someone cuts me off is the day I feel like I've reached enlightenment, <laughs> which I don't know that I'll ever get to in my lifetime. But just to be softer, you know, if someone does something, it's like, it's not about me. Yeah. All good. Thank you. You know what I mean? Just like in everyday interactions, just being a little softer. I read that you practice Reiki. Does that help, like, you. Yeah, keep I your energies calm? <laughs> yeah. You're like, I this do. energy needs like, to go. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I practice Reiki. I'm... I have like my little altar table. I have a meditation room in my house. I love all my crystals and oils. And Ooh, I love that. Yeah. It's, I'm just getting into some of that. And it's yeah. so fun. Again, it just kind of gives you feel like you have a little control. You're like, I'm totally. going to control my own mood, not like I external forces. always have like a different crystal. I'm actually like, um, so when I'm working, the safest place to keep them is in your bra because they don't fall out. And out of pockets, I leave them and then dry cleaning gets them. And I'm always calling wardrobe. I'm like, I left a crystal. They're like, again. <laughs> but so you can put it in your bra, actually, as a woman. Sorry, men. I don't know where you guys would keep them, but not my business. You guys have other perks, OK? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and in one scene, though, I guess I was like, it was like a thing. And something <laughs> dropped out of my shirt. And my co-star, Nick Galvis, he looks at me and he's like, what did a crystal just drop out of your shirt? And I was like, yes, we can ignore that. Keep going, keep going, please. I love that. I love that so much. Well, it was so fun talking to you guys. Thank you. If you guys want to check out Chicago Med, it's on Wednesdays tonight at 8, 7 Central on NBC. Give it up for Tori DeVito. Thanks, guys.